decision and ministerial decision making. Mm -hmm. There are two definitions I really want to use, Mr. Speaker, out of the dictionary. One is the opinion of the minister is reasonable. The minister's discretionary power cannot be delegated to another person. Any decision regarding the exercise of the discretionary power must be made by the minister personally. And the second one is the freedom to decide what should be done in a particular situation. Now, Mr. Speaker, most of the acts, and I took examples from two that fall under the Ministry of Public Works that set out what ministers' responsibilities are. And so, in one case, um, in, in terms of speaking to um, directions that the minister can give in, in, in two boards and committees, um, it states the minister may, after consultation with the corporation, give to the corporation directions of a general character as to the exercise and performance by the corporation of its functions, including the exercise of rights conferred by the holding of interest in companies in relation to matters which appear to him to affect the public interest. And the corporation shall give effect to any such direction. It's also the power to give direction to the corporation under this section shall not, withstanding the limitation therein in the giving of directions of a general character, extend to the giving of the corporation of directions of a general or specific character, which appear to the minister to be requisite to secure that the corporation's functions are exercised and performed in the most efficient manner. And the last one I'd like to read, Mr. Speaker, is um, the removal of a member. The minister may at any time revoke the appointment of any member other than the ex officio members if he considers it expedient to do so. Now, I, I lay that groundwork, Mr. Speaker, because I want to set out that those things that I just read are parts of an act. So they're part of the law of this country. Laws that the PLP government have never touched in terms of changing what I read. They, uh, they, we inherited those and we're following those. Now I know that those laws were written with the full expectation that a PLP minister would never be making those sorts of decisions. Those decisions would be made by those who were chosen to be ministers of the government. But I, being a soldier, Mr. Speaker, am used to following, or I was used to following rules before I became a soldier. It's a little bumpy ride to get to following rules, but I've learned over the years to figure out what the rules are and then operate within them. And so, Mr. Speaker, the act often says the minister shall. And he, that means he can do after the deliberation and consultation with his staff and experts and what have you, he can use his judgment or his discernment or his decision-making processes to come up with a decision. So, I know that there's no shortage of people in this country who believe to themselves that they could do a better job than every minister in the PLP government. They don't have no hesitation in telling us so. Now, that's not consultation. That's trying to get you to do what they want as opposed to following the process and carrying out the promises that we made. So, Mr. Speaker, I say all of that to say how bemused I was this week by some of the false outrage and criticism 
over the demolition of a slave house. And I say this has more to do with genuine outrage. I find it peculiar, Mr. Speaker, at the very least, as a black man, I have been lectured, criticized, and condemned by a whole host of white organizations and white people in this country about not honoring our national hero, Mary Prince. All for ordering the demolition of a slave master's house, Watlington House, it's not named Mary Prince House, Mr. Speaker, I cannot even begin to express how confused and incensed I am by the suggestion that, and the media reported this, and this is the reason for justifying the criticism, that a 12-year-old girl was sent to this house to be prepared to be sold by her own mother. Mr. Speaker, I can't even get past the fact that I find that completely abhorrent. I don't understand why the house is historic. It should have been knocked down years ago, in my humble opinion. It should. And the fact that the place is dilapidated, and some say we've done that deliberately, and had to be knocked down, means nothing to no one. Because all of the entities that have trotted out to say it should be saved, and they do that at every building we try to knock down, um, and say that, it's historic. Not one of them offer up two cents to restore the building. They want the Bermudian taxpayer to do it. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm really lost for words. But in this, in this situation. I, I am truly lost for words. Mr. Speaker, I am a direct descendant of slaves in this country. My great, great, great grand, maternal grandparents were slaves. So in 2023, their great, great, great grandson ain't standing for any of the stuff that they have to stand for. Mr. Speaker, I and my five siblings were raised by Alice and George Birch of Somerset and were taught who we are and whose we are. And were raised to stand up for what we believe is right and correct. And that's how I've approached my responsibilities in this ministry. The only difference is I usually on major decisions, not just in the ministry, but in my life, take a vote. And usually it's three nothing. <laughs> and in this case, it's six nothing because we voted twice. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I know that um, people in this country for going on 25 years now have called me the same names that my parents wouldn't call me. And, and Mr. Speaker, it rolls off my back. But I would have thought that they would have been bright enough to figure out that what you think and say about me has nothing to do with me. Absolutely nothing. And so for all of the people that race to the Royal Gazette to put their comments, I don't read them. 
So I don't, I know what you think, but I can't quote you. And the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, I'm probably not going to be doing this for too much longer, so they'll be cheering. But whilst I am, I intend doing the job that I've been asked to do to the best of my ability. And I will use the same criteria that I've used since I started doing this. Way up the decision. I'll, I'll give you a practical example, Mr. Speaker, because they they oftentimes think they're slick. So, um, do I want to name them? Name them? Okay. The Bermuda National Trust, Mr. Speaker, who are one of my favorite people, because they are first in line to to set out. In, in, in specific language, what I should be doing and the risks for not doing, following their instructions and what have you. I think they think that I don't, the PS and I don't chat, but we actually have a very good working relationship. I share with him stuff that I do most of the time and, I, and he shares with me. And I by most of the time I will say, I'll qualify it like with this. If I'm going to make a decision that he needs plausible deniability, he will pass. He will pass the the the, the, um, um, the lie detector test because he can honestly say, "I don't know anything about what that man did." And I'll give you a practical example of this. We've been trying to knock down buildings, and so we had a list. And I've learned a few things about that business that, you know, they call it mobilizing when you bring the bulldozers and they stop to take things away. So we had two buildings, one at um, the National Sports Center and one across the street from there. And I said, if we're going to mobilize for one, we might sort of arrange to knock down both buildings at the same time. And that means doing all the, all the paperwork. So they decided they were going to knock it down and not tell me. But coincidentally, the PS and I were driving by, and they were working on the building at the National Sports Center, so we stopped. And I asked the guy, I said, are you going to cross the street after you finish this one? And he said, no. I said, oh, really? I said to the PS, where are these beef pies? He said, no problem. And so off he went to get beef pies. I called the company and I said, we had a deal. Mobilization once, knocked on that other building too. And I never said anything to him because I knew that at some point, the Deputy Premier's Department planning would come and say, you knocked on the building. And I never lied, so I said, I said, me. And so the PS was able to... He came and said to me, somebody's knocked on that building. Do you know anything about it? I said, P.S., I wanted the building to be knocked on. And he says, I don't know nothing about it. I said, that's exactly right. You're not supposed to be in this. I am. I say that to say, Mr. Speaker, that I think most of the ministers that the PLP has produced um, in government have approached this job with the view that they're going to do the best they possibly can at, at what it is they've been asked to do. Um, and I think that in the main, the civil servants are committed to doing a good job, many of them, not all of them. You know the ones I have challenges with. Um, but what I, what I do want to say, Mr. Speaker, and I'll close on this, is that I don't think I'm made different. I think I was raised different. And that is, I don't have an issue with making decisions and accepting the responsibility for when they go wrong. Because 99% of the time, they're going to go right. 
And there's, I've been doing this long enough to, to smile at various things that I've done that people criticize up the yin yang and not that they forget that I was the one who, who, who did it. They sing its praises. They'll go back to, they'll go back to criticizing <laughs> if, I, if I started naming some of those things. But I'd smile at the fact that this job allows you the ability to affect change and to help people, and particularly public works. I asked to be in this job because I wanted to be in a position where I could help people right where they live, not just the people in my district, but the people throughout the country. And whilst I get from most of the people in this room emails about issues in their district, I try and, and, and fix them all. I started to tell a story about the National Trust and that, and so they wrote about their Palm Sunday war. And they didn't write to me. They wrote to the PS to ask for permission. And here's a good PS. He said, Minister, here's this. And so I saw the email, I read it, and I went back to him and I said, I said, I note that the, that the National Trust wrote to you for permission and not to me. They obviously still annoyed with me. I said, but I'm a big boy. I have no objections to them walking on government property. And so I approved. But I just smiled because that is petty. That is childish. And I could have been equally so by saying no. But I know the number of people in this country that enjoy National Trust walks. And so I said, without any hesitation, other than the fleeting moment of pettiness, I'm thinking, I should do this. And then I said, it ain't worth the hassle. It's not the right thing to do. I rise every day, Mr. Speaker. And before I leave my house, both of my parents are in heaven. And so that's why, and they used to lecture a lot. And so that's why I get irritated when strangers try and lecture me. Because there's nobody left on earth who can lecture me. They're in heaven. But I don't leave my house any day without thinking, honor thy father and thy mother all the days of my life. I, I thank them now for being disciplinarians and being not afraid to use the rod of correction. Um, but it's held me in good stead. And I shall continue to do this job to the best of my ability for as long as I have the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Does any other member wish to make a contribution this evening? MP Anthony Richardson, you have your time on the clock. Yes, good evening, Mr. Speaker. Good evening. Always late, but <clears throat> this, right now I'm being obedient to one of my constituents who told me to make sure I do this and to commend them because they are still listening. And so, Mr. Speaker, I arise on a positive note. I think it's a positive note. is to talk about um, sports. This week has been a, a different week for me because I've had time to spend lots of times um, with respect to sports. And the, I've been excited. And I just want to put on the record that obviously we all know all of us, but most of us will believe that funding sports is important because it represents an investment in our various communities and has a long-term and significant benefit. Mr. Speaker, Today, actually, it culminated with me being um, asked or requested to do a presentation on behalf of the Continental Society, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity and Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, <laughs> which was an interview digital and financial literacy session um, to the Dandy Town Youth Academy, both football and napball players under 13, under 15, and under 17. And in total, in total, there were about 30 young people that were there, and I had the opportunity to, to um, talk to them or work with them in five different set, um, sessions about financial literacy, about budgeting. And I was very impressed, to be honest, because they were being the ages between, say, 13 and 17. They knew what they were doing. 
And the, the example in most cases was that many of them actually work in packing groceries. And it was surprising to, I guess it was reaffirmed that they made quite a bit of money doing that. And some have a very good support system that requires them to take what they earn. Some of them have to put money aside for school lunches and other necessities. Most of them actually have to save a portion and then the parents allow them to spend the extra. And in one case, the young gentleman was disciplined enough whereby he wanted to buy a bike, for example, a pedal bike. And his mother had told him, well, fine, you can buy the bike out of what you've earned and I will pay half if you pay half. And that's how they, how they move forward. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I also attended the Magic Mile last week, Saturday, which was quite exciting again because there were about 900 children that participated. And I got there in the afternoon time. And as I drove up a metal road, I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to find a parking space. There were cars all over the place. Obviously, people had tried to find a parking space, and I was eventually able to do so. And then again, Mr. Speaker, when I got there, you saw everybody. Multiples, parents, grandparents, godparents, brothers, sisters, and families all, and friends, to really cheer on the young people. And what really touched me, Mr. Speaker, was that there was one young man. He was like, I don't know, maybe eight or nine, less than 10 for sure. And he physically was not able to do what he would want to do normally. But his mother held up a sign. And if I remember correctly, his name was Kieran. And she walked amongst the stands and said, my son, Kieran, is going to run. And we want you, she wants us to cheer him on. And everybody cheered him on. And he pressed his way until he finished what his race. Tremendously, tremendously proud that everybody supported him in doing that, Mr. Speaker. And there, Mr. Speaker, I had the honor in, I think it's number 14 for MP Keynes to attend the Prospect Primary School Sports Day on Thursday. Yes, I read in his state. And it was again, a enriching experience to see the parental and community support. What was very touching, Mr. Speaker, was that, as we all know, in primary school, the younger children are age P, uh, in P1, and then they go up from there. And when they, the school got to say races for the P3s, there were parents that were saying, hey, hey, you missed one of the P1 races. And they went, they figured out what happened is that the children themselves were able to select what class, what race they were gonna participate in. And nobody had participated, nobody in P1 had chosen to participate in one of those races. And therefore, they put on a sack race for the P1s. And of course, the parents then got excited. And then I was told there was one race whereby the parents were supposed to participate in the race with their children. And then parents being proud as they are, some said, well, no, I'm not quite sure. But their children encouraged them to do so. And you could see the excitement, Mr. Speaker, when you saw how the parents would respond to the children. Mm -hmm. And there was one race whereby, say, around 100 meters, the parents would run the first 50, and the children run the second 50. And the children themselves were significantly overjoyed to see that their parents were participating and they were able to join in together. Mr. Speaker, we also have the national cricket team that has had tremendous success. They came back, I think, well, they came back sometime this week. And it was good to see that they did very well, but how they gelled. And what I'm looking forward to, Mr. Speaker, is that they remain consistent and committed to their training and to their personal discipline to allow them to stay together and to generate some continued adhesion. A less thought of or less known, I suppose, is um, Mr. Phillips, who's a tennis player. He's probably about 17 or 18 now, a little bit older than that. And he advanced to the semifinals this week in a Las Vegas tournament. He is a young man. I do know him. Um, he has been very diligent. And actually, Sam Mabry is one of his coaches. And what happens is it's an expensive sport, tennis is, because you have to travel all over the place. And he and his mother and others have been very diligent in trying to ensure that there is funding for that process. Mr. Speaker, again, staying in this mindset of sports, the Bermuda School Sports Federation is going to be hosting the annual school track and field championships, championships starting on Monday, March 13th, at the National Sports Center. 
And I say that because it's a chance for the children to participate in preliminaries and their finals. And I'm hopeful that we're able to support because I'm also mindful of the fact that, well, I was told is actually, that we don't fully appreciate the number of Bermudian children that have been able to go overseas and advance their university careers through athletic scholarships. Obviously, there are others in terms of football and the rest of it, but there is a significant number that have actually also proceeded through athletics. And there, Mr. Speaker, I come to Carifta. This year, I've been told that it's the 50th anniversary. It's going to be held in Bahamas from April 7th to 10th. And the number of events that children are going to participate in is 43. One of my encouragements to everyone here and also the broader community is that the cost is going to be $50,000 to send the team down to the Bahamas. And a chunk of that, a bulk, the bulk of that is actually the airfares because they have to obviously, you know, all get there. And there is somewhat short notice because of the way they go and select the team. However, we hope that we are supportive collectively. Um, and they've chosen 29 athletes, thus 29 athletes in total, plus the, um, the team manager and the rest of them is going to bring it to a total of 31. I had the opportunity to speak to some of them, and I know that the fundraising is now underway. And I think publicly, they've generated, in addition to their normal budget from youth and sport, they have been able to generate an additional $15,000, and so they're going to keep on pressing the way to get the balance. The team, Mr. Speaker, was announced by Mr. Freddie, or Dr. Freddie Evans, who is the president of the Bermuda National Athletics Association. And I don't know the gentleman, but it was touching because before he announced the team, he did pay, he did pay tribute to a Bermudian champion who unfortunately succumbed recently, who was a Front Street Mile champion, Egan Herman, and he passed away in February after a battle with cancer. Omen, sorry. And he would have actually also been going to Bahamas to represent Bermuda. And so, Mr. Speaker, again, staying with this theme of Carifta, in the under-17 girls, there are nine athletes. In the under-17 boys, there are six athletes. In the under-20 girls, there are five athletes. In the under-20 boys, there are nine athletes. And the coaches that would have you will consist of Devon Bean, Jerome Richards, Janine Scott, Terry and Painter, with manager Jerry Swan, and physiotherapist Norbert Simons. Mr. Speaker, I started by saying that funding sport represents an investment in our, in our community. And in this instance, Mr. Speaker, I'll get to my main point, I suppose, in that the Carifta event also represented and demonstrated a coming together for the sole purpose of ensuring that as many athletes as possible would be able to attend Carifta. And in that vein, Mr. Speaker, I want to especially commend Coach Steve Burgess, who went out of his way. There are many others, but I want to highlight um, him for sure. And also want to co um, commend Mr. Philip Woolens and Seamus Ferrin. Now, why? The reason why, Mr. Speaker, is because those three gentlemen went out of the way to assist another person who, well, Mr. Burgess knows him, but the other two did not know him at all but they went out of their way to assist in ensuring that the team would, would be maximized. And this is where it becomes personal, Mr. Speaker, because my son had never participated or even expressed an interest to participate in this type of track and field event. 
and he his overseas in school. And for reasons which are not even known to me, he has dedicated himself to doing all this, in my words, crazy running in freezing temperatures. And he came back and did the, the um, Triangle Challenge in January. And then some individuals saw him and said, you know what, maybe you should consider doing this thing. And when he was going to come back, there was no timing to actually run and try to trial for Carifta. And so we contacted Steve Burgess and some others and said, okay, he's going to come back, and what can we do? Mr. Speaker, the organizers of the Skyport Magic Mile allowed him to use their entire facilities at the end of the event to do this thing, to do this trial. And what was even more amazing is that Mr. Woolens and Mr. Farron acted as rabbits in the race to ensure that my son will be able to more easily maintain his pace. Mr. Speaker, these are older gentlemen who have no relationship at all with my son. But they took the time, Mr. Speaker, on a Saturday afternoon to assist him in achieving what he set out himself to be as a girl. And thankfully, Mr. Speaker, and even toward the end, Dr. Evans said to the crowd, listen, there's going to be one more event at the end of all of this stuff, and I want you, the spectators, to remain. And Mr. Speaker, many of them remained, and it was the combination of the cheering for 12 and a half laps, 12 and a half laps running around the field, with people calling on his name, people didn't even know him, but people called on his name, and that was part of his encouragement to achieve that result. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'll say this also, that subsequent to that, I talked to Dr. Fred Evans some more, and then I met, and I got to get this right, Ms. Mia Bean, whose maiden name is Black. Can we get it right? Exactly. Audie Black's granddaughter, Gavin Black's daughter, who have a significant history in our community. Quite feisty, quite aggressive, I told her, <laughs> but she gets the job done. And she is one of those persons, there are many more, of course, who work and work and work behind the scenes to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that our young people are able to achieve what they would like to achieve in terms of their future success. Mr. Speaker, we all know in this room that a young person's success is very much tied to them identifying for themselves what they will do. And so in some cases, it may be music entertainment. In some cases, it may be, um, actually, it may be app development. In some cases, Mr. Speaker, it may be what causes me some challenge sometimes is video games. And what I say by that is that they will do these things, they know what they want to do, and they will then do other things, i.e. the schoolwork and what have you, in order to make sure that they're able to do what they want to do. And so it does cause them to have a level of discipline and then achieve what they really want to achieve. All kinds of different things, but that's a challenge, but that's what they do. And so, Mr. Speaker, I also want to mention the fact that part of the process is that you must have an official time. And even the timing system remained in place after the magic mile to ensure that his time would be done officially and can then be conveyed to the Carifta, athlete, the Carifta so that he can actually go forward. So, Mr. Speaker, I am not necessarily talking about my son in this instance, although that was the example that I gave. It's more about the need for us to continue to support our young people in all that they do. Because so often we focus on those few, and I do say those few, that may not be doing what they're supposed to do. There are so many more, Mr. Speaker, that are doing what they should be doing, and we need to make sure that we commend them. We need to, Mr. Speaker, commend the parents. And sometimes, Mr. Speaker, there are single parents that are going over and beyond to ensure that their children can do what they want to do. What comes back to mind now is, as I went to National Sports Center last week, Mr. Speaker, as I walked into the grounds, there was a young mother talking to her son 
And she was saying, okay, when you run, don't start off too fast. Don't get tired. And I tapped on the back. I said, yes, mommy, you go. You be the proud mommy. Because that's what we need to do to ensure that our young people feel encouraged and supported by their parents and the broader community. And so I'll say one more time, Mr. Speaker, clearly investing and supporting sports and many other activities is very important to ensure the success of our children up front. My final comment, Mr. Speaker, is that the minister, the Honorable Owen Darrell, Owen Darrell, sorry, who did remind me that the government in this instance, this budget actually, has actually set aside an additional $300,000 to be particularly used to assist the, high, I forget that quote, but the, the um, elite athletes. And so to the, <laughs> to the extent that we have athletes that need more support, and it is expensive, that the government this time around has put aside more money to do more for those elite athletes. And to that degree, I do commend the minister, of course, the government generally, and again, for the broad public, let's make sure we get behind support, not just in words, in deeds, and also in financing, including the business community, which are doing a very good job, Mr. Speaker, because they do tend to um, provide the bulk of the financing for all these teams. And it's, of course, it's cricket, it's hockey, it's tennis, it's a multitude of triathlons. There are a multitude of things that we have so many young people excelling. And I'll say one more time that today, for the organizer, actually, Ms. Bernadette Tucker, who organized or at least encouraged me to come and participate today, that presentation at Victor Scott Primary School to all those young people was truly, truly um, an encouragement, an encouraging sight to see how eager they are how they understand about financing, they understand about budgeting, and they understand that when you get money, it's safe first, spend later, and not the reverse. That is a major lesson to be learned. And so for that, Mr. Speaker, I will say thank you and encourage one more time for us here and the broader public to make sure that we support all those in their sporting and other endeavors because it is an investment for our future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member wish to make a contribution? Yes, good famous? evening, Mr. Speaker. Good evening, honorable colleagues, and yeah. good evening to the people of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I want to start off wishing happy 93rd birthday to a lady who is somewhat one of the mothers of Devonshire, Mrs. Lucille Woolrich, mother to Oliver, Julie, Julie Kay, Ricky, and Vicky. She's also the grandmother to Minister Owen K. Darrell. Mr. Speaker, on the same vein of a mother of Devonshire, I want to give condolences to both the Bailey and Flood family on the loss of the matriarch Lavinia Flood of Greenacres, Devonshire. She was a lady of class, stature, fortitude, anything you can think of positive, this lady was posed in that category. And I suspect that her going home service is going to be one of the biggest that St. Paul's Amy has seen in quite some time. Mr. Speaker, in the same vein of family, on Wednesday I was planning on coming here and standing up and speaking for my family because some folks took it upon themselves to conflate some of his words. I'll get into the word conflate later. But on the eve of me getting up to speak, somebody else in my family said, no, no, sit down, sit down, sit down. I got this, cuz. I got this. Nobody's messing with our family. So I say to the Honorable Jason P. Hayward, we know what you said. We know why you said it. And everybody in this room who wears green has had a dog sat on them. Every one of us. We may not have said some things to the people that came to 
police station because we knew they weren't going to come talk to us anyway. But this speaks to a bigger issue. Right? If we do the damn, we talked about dogs earlier today. If we do the demographics in this country of who owns dogs, we know who owns more dogs than others. Right? But ask yourselves, right? Minister Vance Campbell could tell you, we in, in canvassing constituency nine, off of Mogol's Hill, there's a certain road, I won't call the name. No, no, it's quite all right. He does. We had dogs sat on us. In, in constituency 13, MP Kim Swan and I was canvassing for Dan Minister, well, he wasn't a minister then, but Dan Senator. Diallo Rubin. Just say dogs were there, man. It was dogs sat on us. It was a lady from Somerset. I think you know, Mr. Speaker. They used to call her Pinky. Who said she ran out canvassing with Mr. Cox. And they set dogs on her, on them. And she outran Mr. Cox. And I'm not talking about Bill Cox either. Eugene Cox. There's a pattern in this country, Mr. Speaker, for some people that we get dogs sat on us. So I say to my younger cousin, I was going to speak, but big cousin tell me, hold on, hold it. He will deal with it. So no, I will feel you're in this thing or there, cousin. We got you. Mr. Speaker, I'm moving on. Conflation. The Webster's Dictionary says conflate, to equate two things, to fuse or blend. Recently, that's definition one. Definition two, recently used with the word confuse, conflate, confuse, con artist, all the same. Webster's, Webster's Miriam Webster. Mr. Speaker, I've been noticing a trend with the OBA as of late. Anything we say or do, I shouldn't say anything, many things that we say or do, they try to conflate it to say the PLP is anti-IB. The PLP is anti-foreigner. The PLP is anti-unmelanated people. Mr. Speaker, when the Honorable Premier floated, floated, some ideas about the budget. OBA candidate Vic Bow, self-appointed maybe, said, here we go again, the PLP is anti-foreigner. The PLP is anti-IB. Right? One of the three. And, okay, he said it. But I asked him to back that up with facts, with the fact that IB has grown the most under the PLP. The colonel would know, since 1998, the growth of IB. One of the three has said to me, a lot of UBP, former UBP supporters says, hey, if we knew we was going to make this much money on the PLP, we would have got rid of the OBA quicker. So I said, UBP, calm down, calm down. You're not UBP. You're not UBP. I'll give you that much. All right? My, my point, Mr. Speaker, this conflation, this constant narrative that the PLP is anti-IB. In 2001, there was a growth of IB. In 2005, there was a growth of IB. So much so that a former premier has to say, how can we restrict how many cars are on the road? Because, whoa, it's traffic jams. Too much, not too much, but so much people in the island under the PLP. Mr. Speaker, we've heard over the last few weeks the growth of IB in the last year or two. 
under the PLP. So this narrative about we're anti-PLP, we're anti-unmelanated people, how, how is that if we've got growth? Mr. Speaker, moving on, more conflation. We had a someone last week took a took a two second what do you call that voice note clip put on Twitter. OBA somebody sits in another place. Let me put it that way. Puts it on his Twitter. Says PLP does not want your vote. He is anti IB. I, I won't call no names. But I, I said to myself, let me think for a minute. I know what was said, so that had nothing to do with IB. But, but you know, in theory, people who are coming in to vote, coming in to work, can't vote anyway. So how does how does how are they conflating the fact that that even if he said it, how is that enough to do if he want don't want to vote? They can't vote anyway. Conflation, key word. Merriam Webster too confused. Con man. Mr. Speaker, it goes even further. Our honorable member in this house got up on, on a, some sort of social media earlier this week and said, oh, there's a problem with the passports, and that's going to cause people, people who's coming in to look into events to, to have second thoughts. I'm saying, if you're an outside investor coming in, you already got a U.S. or U.K. or some sort of passport. Our challenge is with Bermuda passports because the UK tell us we have to send it out there because we they don't trust the OTs with passports anymore. Mr. Speaker, again, how does someone coming in and looking to invest in this country is going to be concerned about our passport situation? That has nothing to do with it. Zero. Again, conflation, confusion, con man. Mr. Speaker, they need to stop. Because the more they do it, the credibility gets eroded. Moving on, Mr. Speaker. Not a big word. I, I learned from my honorable colleague from 14, what big words. Abdication. But I learned also to give a definition. Abdication. To renounce one's throne or fail to undertake a duty. Abdication. Mr. Speaker, in 1936, there was a king called Edward. He was king of the British Empire at his height. The, no, that was his brother. I know a little English history. And then under, he was king of, of, of India. Like, he had everything. Along comes a lady from America, Wallace Simpson. Another lady from America, or the first lady from America. And he wanted to marry her, and the Church of England said, you can't marry her because she's a divorcee. And he says, well, I'm going to give up the throne for the woman I love. Imagine giving up the British Empire for American lady. <laughs> American Revolution won. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, What's the relationship to Bermuda? Up until about 40 years ago, Bermudians were the kings of the construction industry. Bermudians of all color, black, white, Portuguese, we were the kings. We built iron homes. We built most of these buildings in Hamilton. Churches, schools, you name it. We built it. Somebody needed something fixed, called Jim. Somebody needs something built, call John. We did it all. Somewhere in the 1980s, we began to abdicate our throne. We began to say, we don't need our sons learning these trades. We don't need our children in the hotels. Let a foreigner do it. Well, guess what, Mr. Speaker? Two, dec two, two generations later, non bermudians are running the trades because we abdicated it. I say that in the context that recently 
the colonel mentioned about Fremont Southampton and all what they want to do, especially train young Bermudians. And I say that in the context that the Bermuda College, of which I declare my interest, I sit on the board. We fought to have trades up there, back trades back up there. Guess what, Mr. Speaker? Low attendance, low enrollment, I should say. Mr. Speaker, all what the Colonel and others are fighting for to get Bermudians in the hotel is going to be to naught, to zero. If our people don't understand that we have to retake our throne. I don't mean, I, before, before the world exec twists up, I don't mean kick out foreigners. It means our young people have to have a hunger to work in not only in the trades, but in the hospitality industries. We go to Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, there's other people running big, big places, three times bigger than Fremont, Southampton, will ever be. Bahama, 95% Bahamian ran from management all the way down. No shortage of Bahamians wanting to work in that industry. You go to Jamaica, no shortage of Jamaicans wanting to work in that industry. I am saying this to our people, black, white, whatever color, right? We have to take back what is ours as far as learning trades, being able to do the trades, being able to build our own houses. We ain't got much space left, but at least maintain our own houses. Because short of that, the reality is, if our young men or young women don't learn a skill, Foreigners are going to come in, have to do it, have to come in. Minister Abel is going to have to sign more work permits, right? And our people are going to be either on FA or getting on BA, one of the two. That's the, that's the reality. It's the reality. Mr. Speaker, we could come up here and we could pontificate, we could call each other names, whatever. But at the end of the day, if our people is getting on BA, right, of course we're going to have to... Next time is going to be bring in 9,000 people because our people are not here. And it's not because, oh, the government's failed them. No, we have to take a responsibility as a people. We have abdicated our throne. Mr. Speaker, with that, I take my speak seat. I wish you happy Sabbath and God bless Bermuda. Honorable colleague. Yes, Mr. Speaker, um, and I, I've been moved to to move to stand up to applaud MP Famous for what he just spoke, because Mr. Speaker, we recognize exactly what he's saying over in education. Mr. Speaker, studies show that children at the age of eight start to rule out what they do not believe they can do. By the age of eight, I'll repeat that. By the age of eight, they rule out what they do not believe that they can do. We are building an education system that gets our children in position to understand that they can achieve anything that they want starting at the age of five. Mr. Speaker, it is critical that we put the things in place and we believe in our children and give them the opportunity to succeed. And we can only do that if we get along, if we all put our shoulders to the wheel. You know, Mr. Speaker, and, and there was mentioned in here earlier today that there's some people that do not read the Royal Gazette comments. And I'm one of those people, Mr. Speaker. But fortunately, I have a team of people who do, because it's critically important to hear the ignorant comments that are often spewed by persons on the Royal Gazette that do it day in and day out. I absolutely wonder how some of these people actually get along, or is it that they, do they just wait in the morning so they could get up? You have um, tired of the ignorance. Every other word is friends or family. You have people like Robert Stewart who spew borderline racist comments on a regular basis. 
and it's allowed with the Royal Gazette. But what really baffles me is when we look at these comments, especially around education ones, and we are now, Mr. Speaker, four years into education reform. We've opened two signature schools. We will open two parish primary schools. And you know the comment I read in the newspaper last week? Can someone explain to me what this signature school thing is? And these are supposed to be intelligent people. Can someone explain to me what this education reform is actually supposed to cover? But, Mr. Speaker, we glory in the spirit of people like that because it keeps us focused, laser focused on the fact that there are still people out there that not only don't believe in our children, they don't believe that our education reform will work. They just don't care because if they cared, they would do their research before they open their mouths and speak. If they cared, they would visit our schools. They would volunteer to be some of those people that are helping us to create the system that Bermuda needs for our children. So Mr. Speaker, I am absolutely proud. I am absolutely standing here today to say, thank you, Mr. Famous, for pointing out what you pointed out. Because we have to get our people to understand what makes this country work. We have to get our people to understand that not everybody is going to be an accountant. Not everybody is going to be an IB. Not everybody needs to be a doctor to be successful, to be satisfied, and to have a good life in this country. But I will tell you what, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure everyone in here will agree that if your toilet is not working, no matter how much you earn, you're not going to be comfortable. If your electricity isn't working, and you do not have any lights, or that TV can't come on, no matter how much money you earn, you are not going to be comfortable. <laughs> Is that if your Wi-Fi goes off, there are certainly a lot of people who will not be comfortable. But Mr. Speaker, there takes a lot of things to go right in this country for us to go right. And as Mr. Famous pointed out, trades is one of them. This government, Mr. Speaker, has brought back trades as one of our signature, school, signature schools. Mr. Speaker, we are putting those things in place. Mr. Speaker, we are talking to our children before they start to rule out the things that they don't think that's even possible for them. I believe some of the most powerful statements we've had when we do our taste of programs and we have all of those M1, M, M3s and M2s up at work camp last year, and we had persons who do want to give back. We had electricians set up. We had masons set up, Mr. Speaker. We had IB set up. We had insurance companies. We had health care set up up there, Mr. Speaker. We had the aquarium. We had bios. We had all of these things. And children are seeing these things and they're saying, I believe in myself now. We cannot always depend on the people they should be depending on to let them depend on those who can stand up and say, hey, we want to see you succeed. To see a young girl pick up a trowel, lay down some cement, and build a wall is something was a sight to see, Mr. Speaker. To see my daughter come home and say, Daddy, I got to use a drill today. That's what we want our children to have visions of, that no, it doesn't require you to be an accountant. It doesn't require you to chase the dream of being in, in, being the, being in the C-suite to be happy to be successful and to make a good living. So again, Mr. Famous, thank you for spurring me to get up and speak to that. Thank you for getting me these few minutes to tell people, listen, we're building the system, get on board. Don't stand on the peripheral and because it's being done by the PLP, you won't, don't want anything to do with it. We welcome you too. We want you to come because we want to hear from the naysayers, Mr. Speaker. We want to hear from the people who don't care because those are the people who are going to make our resolve even more stronger to do what needs to be done by our children as we move forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.
Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Speaker. Notes. Did I read it? You okay? Yeah, this is been 30 seconds. I got get roughed up. Maybe, anyway, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> I tussled with whether or not I was going to speak this evening, partly because my voice is hoarse, and partly because I didn't know if I should say anything or if I do say anything, what I would say. But I decided that I recognized that my time in this house is for a finite period. And so it would be uh, responsible for me, thank you, to um, use this time wisely and be able to have my say whilst I have this platform. Mr. Speaker, one of my colleagues often reminds us that we as members of the Progressive Labour Party are not homogenous in thought. I agree wholeheartedly with that, and nor should we be. Not only do we represent different constituencies, but we, exactly, not only do we represent different constituencies, <clears throat> but we're also individuals with different upbringings, beliefs, perspectives, experiences, and so forth. And so, Mr. Speaker, I bring this up because there appears to be some that disagree with Minister Hayward's comments last week, his language or delivery. But I rise today to say that I fully support the minister in his willingness to at least speak his truth. And what I find shocking is that even in today, people take issue with a man simply speaking his truth. Mr. Speaker, in our September 30th session, Minister Hayward spoke about members of the OBA labeling him and referring to him as a union thug. And they did so because of a t-shirt that had, or a picture of him wearing a t-shirt that had resurfaced that he wore several years prior. He went on to say how he noticed how he was being viewed differently than those of a lighter hue that wore the exact same t-shirt. But beyond that, Mr. Speaker, the minister expressed in that motion to adjourn that he had no issue with persons voicing their opinion on policy decisions, but asked that there be a certain level of respect and for persons to refrain from personal attacks. And to my shock and amazement, as the minister's words were coming out of his mouth, asking for members of the OBA to show a level of respect, the then chair of the OBA heard those words and proceeded to disrespect and make personal attacks. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague said before me earlier, as members of the Progressive Labour Party, we've all had dogs set out on us at one point or another. I can only imagine what it must be like to have your wife, your mother, and your children constantly read personal attacks about you so frequently as Minister Hayward does. You see, this is not about thick skin because I would even give members of the OBA credit because you have to have incredibly thick skin to be on that side. <laughs> In fact, <clears throat> so this is not about thick skin, 
for the moment, this is about specific individuals being malicious, disrespectful, and just outright rude. Mr. Speaker, let me also acknowledge that I also know that this is not limited to OBA supporters towards PLP. I know the opposition gets their share as well. My point, Mr. Speaker, is that if a constituent thinks so little of a member of parliament that they would set their dogs out on them, or if an individual would blatantly say disrespectful remarks after you humbly ask for them to refrain to do so, if you go through years of constantly being belittled and maligned and undermined, then I cannot ju then judge that MP for getting up and speaking his truth and saying to those specific individuals, I don't want your vote. He did not cast disparagements on a group. He's referred to specific individuals. Mr. Speaker, let us dive a bit further into context. And the minister is here, and so he can correct me if anything that I say is incorrect. But I believe a strong part of his message, or his overall message, is to remind the country, and perhaps more importantly, our members of the Progressive Labour Party, that we are the government. The message I heard from the minister was that this party fought for 60 years to get us to where we are today. And so we cannot be distracted by the noise. We need not squander the opportunity. So I ask, why wasn't that quoted as the headline? Mr. Speaker, the minister was acknowledging that there are far too many that have sacrificed to get us to where we are. And to now be here and continue to bend and acquiesce to those that since the inception of our party have always demonstrated that they have no interest in collaborating with us and do not have our best interest at heart is not only futile, but it is the definition of insanity. Mr. Speaker, I was here last week and Wednesday, and so I heard every word. And the message I heard was that we are government and we need to act like it. Mr. Speaker, allow me to say that I did not hear a cry for division. In fact, what I heard was the total opposite. I heard recognition that good governance requires collaboration. But if we are to be respected as a government, respected as leaders of this country, we cannot continue to extend an olive branch have dogs then set upon us and then continue to extend that olive branch. Again, Mr. Speaker, we are not homogenous in thought. I am not here to say right or wrong, agree or disagree. What I will say is that I appreciate the minister speaking his truth and from my perspective, I want him to know that his message was heard. Mr. Speaker, allow me to finish with this. Ten more minutes, they say. <laughs> After so many decades, it still amazes me how many people still fall for the textbook political strategy 
of taking something out of context and using it as a weapon. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to take a glass of water because now I'm going to get a little controversial this evening. Partly because, partly because it is my goal to make the front page of the paper. It is my goal. <laughs> but I'm going to go there anyway, so just bear with me, Mr. Speaker. Indeed. In the good book, in the good book, Jesus told people to hate their mother and father. It is in Luke 14, 26. In the same good book, women are explicitly told that they are to be silent in the church and are forbidden to speak in them. That is in 1 Corinthians 14, 24. Here we go. In fact, the Bible tells us, tells the slaves that they are to obey their earthly masters with respect and fear. Mr. Speaker, I am not here to try to liken anyone or compare anyone to Jesus or anyone else mentioned in the Bible. All I'm trying to say is that when taken out of context to support a narrative, even the holiest amongst us can appear solid. And so for the combined opposition, to do so deliberately is not just irresponsible. As far as I'm concerned, it's unacceptable. I am grateful that the members of the Progressive Labor Party know Minister Hayward, know his family, know his upbringing, know his heart, know his vision, know his work ethic. And so when the combined opposition tried to take him out of context and malign his character, they were not at all moved. I am certain this will continue. I am certain that every time Minister Hayward makes a statement going forward, as the opposition prepares their election campaign, they will use that statement over and over and over again. But until they can effectively debate us on policy, I'm equally as certain that their character assassinations will continue to fall on deaf ears. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If it pleases you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, something's been troubling me for the last few weeks, and it isn't political. I reflected this week on the country's conversations around Minister Hayward. I reflected this week as late or as early as yesterday with the hypocrisy of this country becoming excised angry, up in arms over the slave master's house being torn down. Everyone writing and, and pontificating <coughs> about these things. <clears throat> and I thought about the fourth road fatality for this year. Didn't move the dial. Nobody marched. Nobody ran down to TCD. Nobody called, the called for more police officers patrolling the streets. Nobody called for legislation to be amended. We have become so familiar with people dying on our roads that it doesn't make a blip. Nobody gets concerned about it. We are in March and have had four road fatalities for the year. Every single day, 
we see a traffic advisory coming out where traffic has been diverted because there has been a significant accident on one part of our roads up and down the island. We see as we drive people coming like bats out of hell, driving as if they have a death wish. And we cross our fingers, hoping that when we get around the corner, that our young person or the person that we see on the bike is not sprawled out on the street. My wife was driving home this week, and she said as she drove the car in Paget, she saw a young man interweaving through traffic. When she got around the corner, she was diverted, and she said, listen, she's just going to drive by just to see. When she drove across, it was the very same young man on the side of the street. We are watching mothers and fathers not only lose their children, but lose legacy. If this were any other country, they will call it a national health crisis. Anywhere else in the world, we're losing 13 and 14 people every single year to road traffic fatalities. The campaigns have weaned and waned. Our people in this country are dying exponentially. At one point, we blamed the roads. When I was young, we blamed pack racing. And we had police officers at every corner. We're doing roadside sobriety checks, but still we do not have a policing plan. We do not have officers dispersed around the country at a rate that can help STEMI these accidents. STEM, STEMI, the question is, is that we're not going to police our way out of this. There has to be a community conversation around road safety. There has to be a conversation in all of the different aspects and, and, and quarters in Bermuda about the significance of what is taking place now. My colleague, Chairs of Road Safety Council, he is always beating the drum about road safety. It cannot just be MP Lister talking about road safety. It must be a collective effort as a country. We must see this as a national crisis. We must see our young men and our young women and have conversations with them about the sanctity of life. If you now see, I saw a young man and he was limping on Saturday night when I went to have dinner with my wife. I did not know what happened to him. When I asked him, he was immobilized using two crutches and it tried to drag his legs on. And I asked him what happened. He said he was in a ro bad road traffic accident five years ago. He shared with me that he's not able to work, that he has to use a colostomy bag, that his entire life has been totally changed by that accident. Our insurance companies have to do more. They simply cannot benefit from taking our insurance premiums every year and not being on the forefront, on the vanguard of making sure or advertising and training. Yes, we have Project Ride, but we have to make and put an emphasis on the insurance companies that are benefiting from our policies to have a greater impact in prevention. If we look at having the conversations as families, asking insurance companies to do more, to put their money into prevention campaigns. If we look at the Bermuda Police Service and question them about their policing methods, there has to be an, an government on looking at the legislation. What can we do? But there has to be something done as a community. We have to go back and start campaigns aggressively in the schools. Something has to be done. Four lives in March is too much, Mr. Speaker. As a country, we must see this as a national health crisis and rally around this issue and work harder to prevent road traffic accidents in Bermuda. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I only wish to say good night.
Members, thank you for your contributions today and your participation. As always, go get some rest because we'll be back on Monday morning at 10 o'clock. The house now stands adjourned. <laughs> We're done. Have a good evening and a good rest.